Uh, hey, so I'm just going to get straight into it because I'm not really sure if I'll make it on time. So I'm going to talk about um, adaptation and components, uh, and components more like in the abstract rather than web components. Um, and this is basically kind of where I'm at in terms of thinking about uh, designing and developing web interfaces. Um, and I'll touch on, like very briefly at the end, um, some op an opinionated set of tools that I like to use uh, that are kind of designed for, for building applications out of components. So it's useful to think about the difference between uh, change and adaptation. So change is uh, just simply something going from one state to another, like it becoming different. Whereas adaptation tends to be a bit more specific. It's about making something suitable uh, for a new use or purpose. So you can think of adaptation as a type of change, but that results in um, a difference that is uh, better suited to new conditions. And adaptation itself encompasses uh, being both adaptable and adaptive. And adaptive is along the lines of, um, you'll have a system that adapts automatically to, to users, let's say. So if I come to your website and I'm a new user, you might display a module that prompts me to import my address book. Um, if I start interacting with the site in a certain way, you might surface some modules over others and try and be adaptive in the sense of just adjusting to the way that I'm using your, your application. Whereas being adaptable is um, the ability to adapt the system itself so that you can respond to uh, environmental changes, let's call them. Uh, so that way you can make sure that your system can change from one point to another in a way that is, uh, is better. And adaptable systems is basically going to be um, kind of what I'm going to focus on over adaptive stuff. So this is like a really basic uh, diagram that I tried to put together to, to show the difference between um, well, thinking about your application from one point in time to another and how it changes over time. Um, and it would change over time because you need to adapt to uh, changing conditions. And those might be you looking for the optimal experience in your application. So it's really unlikely that you've hit uh, in your first release the optimal user experience or the best way to present your information. So you have to change over time to sort of head towards that local maxima. You also have to adjust to user expectations. And that's kind of, that's a complicated thing that changes whether or not you're making any changes to your application. because. If I'm using many different types of application, depending on the qualities that they have, um, the, the relative merits of your application changes in my mind. So if everyone starts making faster apps and your app is, like, doesn't change at speed, then relative to everyone else, your app uh, gets effectively slower. And so my, perceived, my perception of the quality of your application degrades. So you have to be able to adjust to that as well. Then you'll also have to change to the, to the platform that you've built upon. So if you're building Android apps, um, then when the Android platform changes, you will probably also want to kind of stay like roughly in line with that. And as the web platform evolves, um, we tend to make adjustments based on that as well. You also need to respond to your competitors. So that involves uh, stealing from them, like in the kind of Picasso sense of like taking a core idea and adapting it, because um, they're also going to be stealing from you. And also attempting to stay like one step ahead. So kind of making educated um, assessments about where you should be going and trying to make sure that you get there so you're not just in a state of perpetually responding to what other people are doing, but you're actually trying to kind of steer things in a certain direction. And to some degree as well, changes to uh, the makeup of your team, so your human organization. Uh, if you have new people coming in, or um, even if you're just changing the way that people work together, their responsibilities, the way that teams are broken up, that all has an effect on the application. But the way that you structure your company does have, um, does have an effect on, on what you end up putting out in front of people. So whether you're making changes or not, like whether you're adapting your application or not, the, the kind of the effective system boundaries uh, are changing anyway because of the fact that like the boundary is not, um, is not like an absolute thing. It's dependent on the, the outside conditions too. So even if you do nothing, the fact that all the outside conditions are changing means that your boundary is. And kind of knowing where that, the system boundary is is not an easy task, um, but it's pretty important to do so. Because if you have no real idea of like roughly where the, the, like the failure boundary is, then you might spend a lot of time crossing that failure boundary and shipping uh, broken code, uh, like broken user experience to people and not realizing that you're doing it. So the overall quality of your application like, degrades. Uh, on the other hand, if you're too far away from, from, the, from the failure line, then you're operating um, inefficiently, I suppose. You're not really squeezing the most out of the system that you have. You're too far within the bounds of safety. So you want to, be, you want to know like, roughly where, where you can push the system to its limits. Um, so the ability to move quickly and predictably is a, is a major competitive advantage. 
And so while most people have like, um, accepted that the scientific method is a good way of determining which changes you're making are good, um, and again, good is like a subjective thing in, in some cases. But you know, you might have some, some key goals that you have, like I want to increase revenue, I want to uh, increase the number of time, the, the amount of time that people spend on the site, um, and perhaps like referrals, whatever. You might have these like these key indicators that you're looking for, and the scientific method is a way of like making sure that you have like evidence to make you uh, make more informed decisions. But you also need to be able to adapt in time. So you need to make those changes within a certain uh, temporal window. So you can still adapt your application, but if you adapt too slowly, you're, you might be dead before you have a chance to make the change. So adapting within the certain time threshold um, is difficult because you're not really sure exactly how much time you have. Um, but perhaps one of the few assumptions you can make is that if someone else can adapt faster than you, it might be detrimental um, to you and your, your application and like all of you who are working on something. So you're kind of just aiming to be at least as fast as everyone else and preferably faster. And the other thing is like internally, as soon as it takes a lot of time to, to make changes, um, then what tends to happen, at least in my experience, is that a bureaucratic structure manifests in order to decide which changes to invest in. Because, um, because it's not cheap to make a change, it means that there has to be like, a lot of decision making around. If we only have like, X amount of money, then how do we divide that up over time? And how do we make a decision on like, who, to put, who to put the money on? Um, so the, the easier it is to adapt, the, the less bureaucracy you have around trying to decide ahead of time before you have perhaps enough information to know um, like roughly what's going to be a, a valuable change. And so anything that affects the ability to adapt is, um, is worth serious critical assessment to determine if it's required. Um, and if it's not, then you want to kind of get rid of it. And if it is, then at least you know it is. And one of the things that affects your ability to adapt um, is complexity. And complexity is, um, is different, or it's not to be confused with difficulty. It's complexity is, so difficult is a relative thing. Uh, something that might be difficult for me might be easy for you. But complexity is like a measure of entanglement. So if you have many parts of your system, the complexity is how tightly interwoven they are, how much to change one part of the system you have to be aware of, like the rest of the system. And a simpler system is one in which I can make a change to an isolated part without having to build up the entire system in my mind. And equally, sometimes uh, making adaptations itself results in complexity. If your system isn't really designed uh, to take adaptability, uh, if your system isn't designed with adaptability in mind, then uh, you have to spend a lot of time assembling like, the entire structure of the system in your mind before you can make changes. And in my experience, one of the things that sets you up for uh, complexity is technology type as an organizing principle. And so a lot of people will just start projects like this, effectively, where you have directories for CSS, for JavaScript, for templates, and for unit tests, and any other like, asset type, perhaps. And um, in this like, idealized example, every box is a file, and every letter is a module. So uh, here, like module C is split across multiple directories. So you have um, a kind of loosely defined concept of what module C is, and it's kind of spread out throughout the code base. And so the, in reality, what ends up happening is that you get this entanglement of modules in each technology layer. Uh, so because it's really easy to do this, um, it just happens. And so you might get a single file that has multiple modules in it, or certain modules will become entangled just through, without really wanting them to be. They just, they just kind of do. And while this is mitigated a bit in JavaScript, which has like um, much more solid uh, kind of like programming uh, interface and everything than CSS does, it's, it's a big problem in the HTML and CSS. Um, and Joel Spool Spoolski called this uh, leaky abstraction, or at least he's coined with, the t with uh, leaking. Uh, with he is credited with coining that term. And so he says that like, all non-trivial applications are to some degree uh, leaky. Um, but if we can limit how leaky the abstractions that we use in the applications are, then that's a good thing. Because uh, developers depend on the abstractions that we put into the system. Um, but if the implementation leaks out, if, like, the con if, the, if the, the abstraction itself is not uh, encapsulated, that you have no soft encapsulation, then can be become a source of complexity. And an example of this is, uh, this is just a piece of HTML for a user module. And inside the user module, there's um, a button module and an avatar. But you'll see that they're kind of, the implementations are exposed. So if I just look at the avatar itself, um, there's, it's really easy for someone to just make a change like this and add a new class like inside the implementation detail of, of the avatar. Um, and avatars are quite a trivial example, but as soon as you have more nodes to realize um, a part of your application, 
then the chances that someone weaves a class through something that you were hoping was uh, like a defined in one place uh, implementation becomes much higher, simply because it's, there's just like a really soft boundary that it's very easy to cross. There's nothing really stopping someone from doing this, so it just happens. And you get a similar problem in your CSS as well, which is, uh, so you have these three modules, and you've got avatar, um, the avatar class exists in all of them. And while the top, the top one there is like the avatar module, it's really hard to know whether the avatar inside tweet and user is um, just a modification of the existing avatar, or whether the implementation of tweet or user just happens to have um, an element that, it's, that they're using the avatar class on, and someone just didn't realize that they've introduced, um, or that they've kind of clobbered someone else's namespace in effect. Like the avatar uh, now can style many things in many different places, and it gets worse as you start to compose those components as well. Because if I decide to put this user card inside of a tweet, then I now have a tweet which has an avatar, which now has like a user, which also has an avatar uh, element inside of it. And trying to work out the order in which everything should be loaded and who actually owns what and whether the avatar inside one component is the same as an avatar in isolation uh, just becomes very difficult to understand because of the complexity that you start introducing everywhere. So I think just using modules isn't enough, basically. Um, if you still try to break things up as modules, you can, you can end up with a lot of complexity because you don't have, um, you can't isolate the implementation. So you still end up with JavaScript modules and CSS modules, but because of the fact that um, they're all just kind of spread out throughout directories based on technology type, there's nothing that really enforces, like, these are all of the assets that are required to implement this part of the, of the system. So if you move away from organization based on technology type and consider that we're building uh, UI widgets that need multiple asset types um, and that to build something like um, a tweet, there's, there's many different assets that you'll need in there, like JavaScript, CSS, some templating probably, maybe some static images. Then you start thinking about how uh, components are a more useful like primary unit of scale in the application. And a, a component, at least the way I'm gonna define it, is a module that encapsulates a set of related functions, um, which can include like behavior, presentation, and the logic that determines when certain presentation is displayed. And so component-based software engineering is based around the idea of assembling and configurating, uh, configuring prefabricated components. And a prefabricated component is more than just CSS. It's everything that you need to create that widget. So you end up with something like this, where you might have a directory for your component A which has all of the asset types that you need. And then B has the same setup, C, D, and then you just have um, a big pile of components in your, in your directory structure, where each one is effectively on the file system as well, uh, kind of isolated, which makes it much more obvious when you're um, using uh, classes and things like that that don't belong in one component in another. And one of the characteristics of components is that they're a simpler um, abstraction than using uh, and just having like just modules and not really a concept of how you assemble all the technologies into one. And simple is, again, like complex, it's not the same thing as easy. Like easy is another subjective thing. Uh, whereas uh, simple is about like a, a lack of complexity or a lack of uh, entanglement between uh, different parts of the system. It's about like A, not knowing about how B is made um, and just uh, basically using the interface that a component provides so the, the consuming component doesn't have to know anything about how um, one of your widgets is, is implemented. It just needs to know what are the configuration options and uh, how do I use it, basically. And so the other thing about components is that um, they're easy to configure and they're composable. So a, comp a compositional model is effectively that I can take um, a component in the UI and then I can embed other components within it. So I might build up, um, let's say, like a tweet box will be built up out of a rich text editor component, a button component, uh, maybe your avatar, and then on top of that, um, that's just like its own implementation detail, but then it can also put other components within it in the same way that you can when you open a div and you can put other elements inside it. There's like a compositional model going on there. And so it's desirable to build like complex systems like this, uh, or to build systems like this because it helps you to um, limit avoidable complexity. And there's complexity that you have to uh, worry about emerging in the system as you, as you adapt it over time. Uh, the easier it is for you to uh, continue to adapt things and to keep the quality of your application high. Because you might find that initially you've built an app 
and people are pretty happy, like you and your development team are pretty happy with how it is to work with it. But then as you start moving away from what the initial requirements were that you, that you took on board in order to build the application, like making the adjustments that you need to, to kind of facilitate the new requirements can quickly lead to a point in time where you start hating the new code base almost as much um, as you felt you hated the old one. I mean, it's, pretty, it's a pretty common thing to come into any old code base and just be like, I hate this, I want to rewrite it. Um, and I think that's part of that is because we perhaps don't spend enough time as, uh, up front as we should thinking about that this is going to have to change. Almost everything that we build, unless you're building uh, static websites for like agencies or something like that. You know, if you're building any personal projects, you want to iterate and to adapt over time. And so making it, easy to, uh, making it easier to do that by not having to deal with complexity is one of the problems is, uh, is worth your time. And like one of the key things that we talk about a lot is reusability. Um, but I've started shifting the way I think about things more towards um, preferring to focus on whether something is adaptable over whether something is reusable. Because the right kind of reuse is valuable, but the wrong kind of reuse creates a lot of coupling and entanglement. So if you attempt to break everything down into like very abstract, oops, I would just break it. But if you attempt to break things down into very abstract uh, reusable pieces, then what you end up um, doing is effectively making, making it such that every part of your application depends on like a huge tree of small pieces, where if you make a change to any one of them, it kind of like bubbles up through the whole system um, and can cause a lot of unintended consequences everywhere else. So having duplication within components uh, or duplication, so sometimes you'll have multiple components and you'll think these things look the same across all of them. And you might naively want to pull it out and make it reusable. But that also means that if there's any divergence at all, if things look superficially similar or have like superficially similar behavior, but then over time they change, you end up having to effectively like undo that reusability um, because of the fact that um, changing one thing affects something else that is no longer, that you no longer want to change when you make an adjustment to another part of the system. And that's kind of what I mean by complexity and entanglement, is that the wrong kind of reuse like really does help create a lot of that complexity and entanglement. So after talking a lot about like um, adaptability and this kind of concept of isolation that components have. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the tools that I quite like using um, that I think you should have a look at. Um, but there's lots of other tools that are component based, but these are the ones that I quite like. So one of them is React that was written at Facebook. Um, and it's a JavaScript library to help you build UI components. Oh, hey. <laughs> um, that's the React guys. Um, and I think there's a lot of things to like about React. Um, but one of the things that it makes uh, very easy and that I think makes it really approachable to designers and developers is that um, it's got a really nice way of uh, defining components that are composable and configurable. And the API is quite small, so it's quite easy to, to kind of dive into it. And this is like, this is like up, up there with the most basic uh, piece of React code that I could write. And all this is is defining a photo component. And then in this return uh, block here, you basically put in something that looks a little bit like HTML. Um, and this is what, this is the definition of the component. And the this.props is a way of you accessing the attributes. So think about um, an input element in HTML, and you'll have like type equals email, uh, that kind of stuff. And this is basically uh, what React allows you to do as well. You can basically make up your own attributes. And the this.props is a way of accessing that. So what this is saying is uh, get the source property of my photo component and uh, put that into the source of this image element. And so you might use it like this. So a slightly more like fully fledged or like useful component um, for the photo might look a bit like this. So here I've got, um, I'm effectively saying in the definition, like the class name is going to be photo plus um, whatever the value of the size attribute is. Then I've got a cropping thing going on. Um, and then this, this dot props dot children is a way of saying like whatever comes inside my uh, component is going to be injected here. And so you might use it a bit like this. And so there's my size attribute, which you still get passed in. And uh, these children here, including this attribution component, are the bits that get rendered in the part where I had the, the this.props.children thing. And so styling of components is the bit that I've been interested in contributing to. Um, because once you have a way of defining uh, a component and isolating the implementation to prevent a lot of this, uh, this leaking that goes on of people like reaching in, then um, the thing you have to think about is how do you prevent the, the problem from the, in the CSS of classes kind of the same class being used in multiple contexts and people like accidentally writing styles that affect different parts of the application. Uh, and I wrote something called suit to help me do this. 
and suit is, um, is modular. Uh, so there's like lots of little repos with lots of different uh, purposes. Uh, and it's not, it's, not like, it's not a toolkit, although I think more and more toolkits are going to try and go the modular way because it makes it easier uh, for them to, to like operate. But suit isn't really a toolkit or a library. It's, um, like I said, it's not really trying to provide you a pile of CSS that you like bootstrap or something where you then have to um, kind of re-implement re all the HTML yourself. It's basically um, a methodology and a simple set of tools to try and help it make it to try and help you make it easier to style uh, these kind of components that you can build with these JavaScript libraries now. And so it's still a work in progress, but um, and it largely caters to a package manager called Component that I'll also talk about. But once NPM has some more stuff, like I'll probably do more to make it work with NPM. So going back to uh, the description, the definition of our component here, um, you see like these are all the classes that I've got. And so if I make a caption component, then it's going to collide with uh, the implementation of photo. And the whole point of having the component in the first place is to make it so that I can use this um, kind of like rich UI widget without having to know about the implementation details. So like kind of leaking these classes like caption out um, without really someone have, knowing that it's there is, is a problem because it means that um, I have to be aware of it and it kind of increases the complexity of the application that I have to encounter every time I want to make a change. So instead with suit or any of these um, uh, CSS methodologies that are based around naming conventions, you effectively uh, take a namespace. And so, because the React component was called Photo, the suit, the suit CSS is also going to use the same name. Uh, it looks exactly the same. It's like kind of this constructor pattern. And so now every single class is prefixed with Photo, and I can be sure that, um, that it's really unlikely that anyone is going to be using like Photo dash caption, caption like this, because they're not going to be making another Photo component. And the CSS ends up looking a bit like this. And this define block at the top is, um, I, I wrote like a little um, conformance tool. So you can effectively tell the tool, um, this is the photo component, and it will run through the file and check that you haven't got any other components defined in there to avoid you uh, inadvertently like create, create, creating this entanglement by having a different component defined in the file for the photo. And so rather than thinking about how do you scale your CSS, um, I think it's quite nice when you start thinking in terms of components that the first component you write and the 1,000th component you write, um, you kind of shouldn't really have to think about anything, anything more when you're writing uh, a component that's stacked on top of like hundreds that came before it. Because as long as you have like, made sure that you, uh, that you don't keep, you know, define another photo component, that you don't take the same namespace, you can, you can do a pretty good job of like, softly isolating the styles. So once you have... Um, this kind of compositional model, you might think, so if I make photo and then I have attribution defined within the photo, and there are gonna be a few occasions when I do want to actually make some adjustments to the attribution component. And so I wanna make sure that the order of my CSS is correct. And so one of the things that is pretty good for doing this is, um, is called component. And this is um, a, node, a node tool that TJ Holloway Chuck wrote. And so if we go back to the uh, component-based structure that we have here, and then just look at one of the components, what component does is effectively ask you to, to define a manifest file called component JSON. And in that file, you, you basically say um, what your assets are. And so in the case of the, the React example that we're using, we won't actually have any HTML assets. But you effectively say, this is my CSS, this is my JavaScript, uh, these are my images, these are my fonts. And you, you tell the tool what the assets are that are required to build the component. And then you can also specify the dependencies. So in the example of the photo, you'd say one of the dependencies is the attribution component. And because it does this with every component, in effect, if I have you know, a couple of dependencies, I don't need to know what they depend on, because that will kind of be the, the chain of dependencies is tracked by the tool. So I can kind of build up this tree uh, where I can make sure that each of the assets that I require, and which is particularly useful for CSS, where the order is quite important, that they're, they're loaded before my component. So with the suit stuff, where you have everything is uh, pretty flat, like the selectors are all about um, just basically one class deep as much as possible. It means that you can rely on uh, your, your selectors coming after the attribution component, and then you could reach in and do like dot .photo, dot .attribution, or something like that, um, and be sure that, uh, that the load order is correct. The other benefit of this is that you don't have to like, manually manage all the assets that you need. So a common problem people have is like, what is the CSS that I'm using? Like, how do I know what the CSS is that I need for the homepage? 
Um, and rather than having to keep track of that manually or work out like, ah, what, what, what components are on the page, like which CSS corresponds to which component, as you kind of like build up this, this tree of dependencies, um, it's kind of tracked for you. So you, you can kind of, this is basically what the component JSON looks like. And at the bottom are the local, the local dependencies. And so because I've said that I depend on avatar and inline tweet box and tweet actions, and then they have their own dependencies and so on. If you imagine this going up and up the chain and then your page is just another component that depends on um, like a sidebar and a top nav and you know, a timeline or something like that. And then each of those have their own dependency trees. So you can be pretty sure that the assets that you're using uh, in a bundle for like, certain sections of your application are pretty, pretty closely in line with actually exactly what you need. Um, and you're not kind of like carrying all this legacy craft around or having to think, do I need this CSS? Like, how do I work that out? So my main point really is that um, building like web user interfaces is more than a CSS problem now. And that as soon as you start building anything um, that kind of goes beyond um, like a relatively trivial level, you'll notice the difficulties that you have um, trying to decide we're trying to do things that, is not, that are not just building the application and adapting widgets, um, that you spend more and more time like managing assets and trying to work out um, how to avoid problems, like you make a change here and for some reason something else changes over there. And as soon as you start buying into a conceptual approach more around uh, something like components, which kind of helps you define an interface and to isolate the implementation a bit more, then it becomes easier to reason about the application. And so something like Suit is designed uh, or aiming to try and play nice with a component-based system. So rather than thinking about how do I manage like a megabyte of CSS, it's kind of trying to just go down to the one level that you really want to be concerned about, which is the individual unit, the individual like web widget, um, and then you can compose more complicated interfaces from them all. And hopefully the complexity is kind of manageable because you've, uh, you've kind of bought into an, an abstraction that, that limits, uh, limits the leaking of, of like implementation details. And because web apps are not static, um, it's good to have an acceptance of the fact that there is this impermanence and to consider that the long-term quality of what you're building is, uh, at least in my opinion, I think it's going to be tightly related to your ability to, to adapt over time and to maintain a certain cadence of adaptability. Um, so, you, you know, changing, changing, being able to adapt quickly at first, but then slowing down as you kind of introduce more and more complexity and like map battle with all these things is kind of what you want to avoid. And, perhaps one of the good indicators of, uh, of a successful system is, is whether in a few years' time after you've built it, there's still a feeling that you can still work at a decent pace um, and make changes to, to meet all the, all the requirements that you have. That's it. <laughs>